Thanks to the library. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. The book is very fresh and in my mind, so it's uh, nice to have an occasion to talk about it. If you don't know Carrie James Gary Marshall's work, work, it begins essentially with this premise, which is that he's a problem solver, and he solves problems both in terms of the mechanics of visual representation, but also what he might like to see that's not being made out there already. And this is something that's true of a lot of artists. In some instances, this incorporates social issues. In some instances, it doesn't. He's mainly known as a painter. He's done all sorts of other things. He recently did the new windows for the National Cathedral in Washington. But from the beginning, prints have been a kind of critical piece of how he has thought about art making and the way he's gone about it. And they've been critical to both forms of that problem solving, one problem being the problem of the Western historical canon, and the other being just the mechanics of how pictures work. So this is a talk about prints, but for reasons that will become apparent, we're going to start with a painting. This is what Kerry considers to be his breakthrough, which he made when he was about 25. It was the first, he says, in which he figured out how to deploy blackness as a rhetorical device. That's rhetorical both in the sense of um, colloquial sense of, say, a talking point, and also in the classical sense of utilizing style to be emphatic and to compel audience attention in a particular sort of way. So blackness in a uh, portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self is both a social and racial construct, but it's also intriguing visual construct, a kind of puzzle for the eye. The picture, has anybody here seen this in person? So you know it's like, right, <laughs> this is not, he gets to monumental later. This so, one is about the size of a, a paperback book, but it but is packed to the gills with all kinds of illusions, beginning with the hat, which, like the title, uh, is nicked from James Joyce. Crazy uh, Toothy uh, Grin comes from a B-movie called Mr. Sardonicus. Has anybody seen Mr. Sardonicus? That's a rarer, a rarer item. It's a horror movie about a guy who digs up his father's body to retrieve a winning lottery ticket and is so horrified by the grinning skull that his face becomes paralyzed in imitation of it and magnificent makeup that was done for this thing, which gets worn throughout the movie. It's not a very good movie. Gave but him, gave Carrie something to work with that was goofy and, and funny, but also discomforting because he's using it in a way that obviously alludes to blackface and minstrelsy and the old saw about black people not being visible in the dark unless they're smiling or wide-eyed. He was also thinking about Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man with the famous quote from the beginning of the book, I'm an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe. Nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible mind. I am invisible understand simply because people refuse to see me. On one level, Portrait of the Artist works as kind of optical parallel to a social reality, but it also does this incredibly important thing that it gets you to look. Leading up to it. He'd been working mainly in collage and in the process of assembling all these pieces, mainly from magazine adverts and photographs, he began to notice all of the differences in printed blacks on paper. And you don't really notice it when they're separated with white space in between or whatever. But when you put them up next to each other, you, you begin to see there's green blacks, there's red blacks, there's warm blacks, there's cool blacks. And when they're abutted, you get this kind of optical depth. Your eye kind of has to work out and then your eye gets rewarded for it. And it's also conceptually kind of salutary adjustment to what we think about when we just say black as a monotone color. But the problem with collages is that they are intentionally provisional, right? They're, they're like a bunch of stuff fallen together, placed together, could come apart again. That's part of the point of collage. And part of what Carey was after was an image that had a kind of authority. For that, he turned to the early Renaissance, in particular to the treatise 
written by Cennino Cennini, turn of the 16th century, 15th century, on egg tempera painting. And that's the medium that he used for portrait. Unlike oil paint, egg tempera dries very quickly. So you don't get to make all those nice, smooth gradients. You don't get to fiddle with things afterwards. You don't get the luminosity. Everything has to be pre-planned in this very careful. You don't really, you don't need to know who Cennino Cennini was to look at Portrait of the Artist and recognize it as an incredibly well together picture because it obeys all of these rules we in the Western world following for 600. And he obeyed all those rules while making something that looked absolutely nothing. The one work of his own that comes before Portrait that he has shown regularly is this. And in a lot of ways, it's the one that kind of points towards what he later does. He did this in his first term at Los Angeles City College for a mandatory class in public speaking. And the assignment was that you had to present a skill to the rest of the class. And he decided to do woodcut, which he had never done. Never had a printmaking class. He had never made a woodcut before. From the time he was basically in kindergarten, he had been trying to figure out how to make pictures. And this involved all kinds of things. He, he watched the television programs on how to draw. He stayed after class in third grade to take tips from a teacher whose hobby was flower painting. He spent tons of time in the how-to section of the local library. He discovered art history books. His tastes were Catholic. He loved comics. He loved illustration. He loved Maxfield Parish and N.C. Wyeth. He dreamed of becoming an illustrator of children's books. He loved Botticelli. He loved Goya. He once said that he was probably the only kid in fifth grade in America who had made decals from Goya's black paintings to put on his lunchbox. L.A. County Museum, he grew up in Los Angeles, L.A. County Museum opened and he's taken there on a field trip. He said, I went from floor to floor looking at absolutely everything in the same way that in the library I would go down the stacks and look at every book without discrimination, that they all had something. But his great hero was the painter and printmaker Charles White. Because in all of that, going through the art history books and going through the museum and even the how-to books, he had noticed, and this is a quote, all of those figures were white figures. All of those angels were white angels. All of those nudes were white nudes. All the little cherubs, all the little pooty and stuff, that's just what art looked like. When he was in fifth grade and doing a book report and came across a book that included Charles White, it opened up this whole other world of possibility or what art could be, what art could pick. When he was in seventh grade, he was chosen for a scholarship for a drawing class at Otis Art Institute, the um, Los Angeles Art School. Charles White taught at Otis. He wasn't teaching that class, but the guy who was teaching the class took the kids to the studio so that they could see Charles White's studio in the absence of Charles White carried this was kind of when the penny dropped. He he later wrote that it made him realize all this work is there and some of it's finished and some of it's just begun and some of it's a mess and some of it's halfway to being solved. He said he realized then that artists are not wizards, that the work they do can seem magical but in reality is achieved through knowledge, a deep understanding of the principles governing representation and a willingness to engage in the intensive labor required. He is still of the opinion that there is no such thing as talent. It all comes down to hard work and anybody who puts in the elbow grease can do it. I have my doubts about this theory, but um, this is absolutely what he believes. He also got interested through a book of Fritz Eichenberg's The Art of the Print. He got interested in the idea of wooding. We have woodcut and woodcuts are usually made by cutting out lots and lots and lots of wood and leaving a little ridge black, of black. a little ridge of sticking up that can be ink and that will produce a line when it's printed. Wood engraving uses a very hard wood block and they kind of work the opposite way, which is you cut out most commonly a silhouetted shape and then you make little cuts within that. So you're basically, with one, you're still drawing with black line most often as you would if you were on paper other than it's a whole lot more work. Um, and the other one, you're using white spots to printed black silhouette. So when you look at the Charles White, he's doing both. It's a lino cut for other reasons, but he's playing. If you look at the shirt, the shirt is all these white lines where everything else has been removed. And when you look at the head, it's the opposite. All of that shaping is done by 
drawing in highlights rather than drawing in uh, shadows. Fritz Eichenberg was a wood engraver, so you get this silhouetting of things and this drawing with light rather than dark. The exact Charles White he kind of necked to do his little woodcut was an etching. It wasn't a wood engraving or a woodcut. But what he did is he took that format of this very diagonal head and the beard as the continuation of the diagonal. But where the etching is all very nuanced and tonal and detailed, he's done a piece of carving on a salvaged piece of a two by four. And you can see where he kind of ran out of space at the back of the head. It's the simplest thing it could possibly be and still be an image. Okay. He's a, he's adopting this this far more sophisticated thing into this other, and this is the actual size relationship. In 1980, he pulls all this stuff together, portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self. Having done that, he has something that he then runs with for almost 10 years, which is this rhetorical, it comes in large part out right. of print, goes into painting, gets pulled out of painting, and back into print. Woodcut Gan is very small. He acquires a tabletop press from, he's working in a paper store, a guy comes in, he says, I have a press and for sale. It was a press that was made for shop owners to be able to run off their own sides. Like, and he realized you could use it for other things, but you can't do yeah. anything bigger than about this. So he's got this little tiny press and he's just messing around. So he begins by doing pieces like this, which you can't really tell in the slide. It's two different colors of black. There's a green black and a warmer black. It's a salvaged piece of lumber, which is why it has a crack through the middle of the head. He's interested in, in sort of pulling um, things from the street, things that already have a life, things that have a personality, things that he actually has to kind of answer. The Nat in question is Nat Turner, who will come up later as well. Nat Turner, slave rebellion leader who Carrie turns into a saint by going back to the Renaissance and nicking the uh, classic early Renaissance flying saucer nimbus hovers over people's heads. He then just starts cranking these things out. Sometimes they're he makes one of them. Sometimes he makes five of them. There's no market. He's not doing proper additions. Almost none of them are numbered. And if they are numbered, don't trust the number because they say things like one out of eight. You say, where are the other ones? And he says, oh, I never only printed the other eight. I just printed the one. So um, this, is, this is before anything gets formalized. He's sending these things as greeting cards, the blue with the guy with the harmonica in his hand. He used as an invitation to a birthday party. It's an entirely experimental way, doing things in order to answer a question for yourself. He experiments with doing things that are illustration-y, and you kind of get where he could have gone if he'd, if he'd stuck with that particular ambition. And then he starts pushing it further. He likes this idea of having something that you need to respond to. He's a huge fan of Delta Blues, and he learned to play harmonica, and he would go anywhere to see great harmonica players and had no qualms about asking for tips. What he, was, what he wanted to do with the printmaking was find a way to put himself in the situation situation where he's wrong-footed and he has to respond to something and invent something new with what he's been given. But he's doing this on his own. So he comes up with this method. He has oil paints kicking around. He doesn't use oil paints. He has oil paints kicking around in the studio. So he squishes oil paints onto a piece of plexiglass, puts a piece of paper on top, runs it through press, the press, and you get what printy folk will call a monotype, which is schmudgy color squished onto the way he's doing it, uncontrolled way. And then he would look at the schmushy color on the piece of paper, and he would cut a wood block to print over top. Does anybody here make print? Okay. You guys know how perverse this is. This is not the way you do it. The way you do it is that you like make an image and then you figure out the color. It's not like the other way around. This is also perverse because he can't repeat the monotype. So he's going through all this labor, an image that you can only make one of in the end. You can keep printing the, the, the woodcut part, but it's not gonna be the same. The first series he does of these, all these heads of musicians, mainly people playing harmonica. He then moved on and did another series where they're all yeah. named after Orishas of the Yoruba pantheon, these gods or godlike figures with these different personalities. He's not paying a whole lot of attention to iconography or things like that. It's, it's more a sort of 
response to what he's seeing, he has kept all his wood blocks, the very first one. So this is the wood block for one of these. This is what it looks like when it's printed in black and white. And this is it printed over a monotype. He did not take any pictures of the monotypes or printing over them, so I can't show you that. But you get the idea. These are two more in that series that got rougher and rougher, and the wood is oddly shaped, and it has cracks, and it has chunks out of it, and he's printing in this very tactile kind of way. The, the ink really sits on top. And then he gets a residency at Studio Museum in Harlem. He takes the press, he takes the woodblocks, he puts everything into his VW van and he drives across the country to New York where he does other things for several years. And then he moves to Chicago um, to be closer to his future and wife, moves into the YMCA in the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago where he lives and works in a six by nine foot room for three years. Paints by standing on the bed, has his press on the floor between the bed and the dis desk, which is where you can see it in that picture. And then over the desk, you see a proof of the print that's on the right side of the screen. When he wins a artist's grant, back when the NEA still gave grants to artists for supporting them directly, he actually was able to get a proper studio and begin working larger. But he still kept up with doing these monotype woodcut combinations, they're becoming much more naturalist. He's becoming more interested, visual expression, body language, things like that. But it's still this, this constant conversation that's going back and forth between what's happening in painting and what's happening in printing. So these two are simultaneous. The press gets put to the side, still in his studio. He doesn't stop the printmaking. And if you look really carefully at this image, you'll notice that the both the carpet and the wallpaper have this repeating pattern, which is a lino cut he made and then stamped across surface. So he's still, it's very much like those early experiments on the press. He is making things to them. He's not fussed about. And when we went to do the book, this was one of the questions is which things count as prints, which things count as paintings. This is something some people get head up about. I, I've always figured that you just ask the artist because there are certain things he thinks of as prints. This is clearly a print. That is clearly a painting. In this one, best known paintings from the 90s, if you look at the t-shirt of the guy on the far left, he ha he's wearing a t-shirt with a lino cut portrait of someone, Carrie can't remember who it is, but but it is a lino cut that we are sure of. As he became better known, he began to get invitations to make works with professional print workshops. Does not like working anywhere, but in his studio, he does not like having other people work for him. Likes knowing that his time is his own. Dislikes the idea that if he's being inefficient, chasing something down a rabbit hole, this is a problem for other people. This is stopping other people from getting, or it's other people's money or whatever. He doesn't like that idea of inconveniencing anybody. In 1995, he agreed to do a list with a Chicago, then based in Chicago, workshop called Anchor Graphics. And at the time, he was working on a series of paintings about scout portraits of black kids doing normal American kid so stuff. The paramilitary uniforms with scouting sometimes lend it a slightly different uh, sense of agency. He's working on the, the print and the painting simultaneously. This is not one thing copying the other in either. It's the same idea recast in two different ways. So the painting is very tight, solid feeling. It's, it's opaque, it's using acrylic, it has this kind of Byzantine icon formality. And when he went to make the print, he'd made a couple of lithographs before that never came to anything, and it was not a medium he liked. He thought it was flat didn't, and didn't do it for him. He does his best to figure out what can you do with lithography that you can't do with painting. And one of the things that you can do with lithography is very thin water. So he does that. He gets this transparency. He also uses all of this sketchy, which he, he generally doesn't do even in his drawings. They, they tend to be very ordered and structured. Contra the painting, he splashes the title across the bottom as if it's, you know, a 19th century fin de siècle poster for some cabaret event. So it's how do you take two different media, the same idea, and push them in different directions. Two years later, he was asked to come visit Tamarind Lithography Workshop, which is the, the nation's most famous lithograph. The turn of the 
1920s and kind of initiated this whole revolution in lithography in America. And Charles White had worked there, so he went. And at the time, he was working on a show that would be done at the Renaissance Society in Chicago called Mementos. And Mementos was a show about civil rights and black power movement of the 60s. And it's kind of this celebration and elegy, these movements. And among the works in the show were these large paintings, angels visiting middle-class living rooms, all of them based on either members of his family or friends of the family. All of them featured these banners at the back, which you can see above the sofa, which he remembered as being ubiquitous when he was a printed felt banners memorializing. In addition to all of that, he has these indoor clouds, these pictures of, and it's all people who, in the case of this picture, it's all people who were killed, who were murdered during the civil rights movement. So you've got Medgar Evers, you've got the little girls from the Birmingham church bombing, you've got the Freedom Riders, you've got, he screen printed them onto the painting, so you've got, and then you've got glitter and all of this other okay. stuff. Keeps it in this odd place of being enormously sad and also it's it's a very strange, so when he went to do the print, how do you take the paintings like 10 feet? He kept everything the same size. So the angels, this is again the right size, but the angel, the same absolute size. He zoomed in on her on the banner, the little cloud of angels at the top, but the rest of the room has dropped away because this is something that will hang in a room. It doesn't, it isn't the room in and of itself. It becomes this sort of portable memorial that can go into any other kind of space. Another piece from that same Mementos show, it's an installation, it's mainly a painter, but he he also does all kinds of other things. And the installation consisted of these sculptures, five feet tall in the shape of handheld rubber stamps. Bottom surface, surface like a rubber stamp, and each one one is a slogan from the civil rights or black power movements of the 60s. And they're, they're actually the things that he then printed part of that installation. There's an edition of five that exist on their own without. Figured out how to use photopolymer, which is a plastic that can be exposed to light to produce a relief surface. So he laid out his own type on the computer, made his plate, and then to print them, rub them very gently on the back, irregularity of a rubber stamp, a real rubber stamp doesn't, and real slogans don't. So it's this slight offset to tell you you're looking at something that's about something. It's not the artifact. It's a quotation of the artifact. It's a nod to something that happened. One of the reasons that is the same reason most artists really do like it, which is you have technicians to handle all the fiddly bits. You have technicians to pull the boring bits, pulling the addition so on and so forth. But he really likes the fiddly bits. He finds the fiddly bits productive and also thinks that having things go wrong is kind of part of the point. It's how you learn from things. He said, you put yourself in a position where you get a little off and you're working to get it right again. Otherwise, it's not interesting to keep doing it. This is why I don't like people making stuff. He has no studio assistant. He um, is one of the most in-demand artists in the world, and artists normally have studio assistants, and sometimes they have whole crews of studio assistants. There's nobody to canvases. There's nobody to keep track of the pieces of paper. There's nobody to answer the phone. gives the work a very, very particular concerns this this particular, this is the most ambitious print. Each one of those panels is a four by eight piece of plywood. The idea was make something truly monumental using a process that we normally think of as something nice that goes in a frame. He cut the blocks himself, did all of the printing himself. There are 12 of these panels that together make an image. So you move from outside with the Chicago city plan laid out below, a window with a window box into a living room. You see these guys hanging out. They've obviously just finished a meal. They're sitting around chatting. Someone's coming in with coffee. And then you move down the hallway. There's a doorway to a bedroom, a very neatly made bed. There's art hanging on the walls. It's just a picture of normal. And his point was that young black men, when they hit the media, to always be part of some hugely positive or hugely negative, as opposed to to print these. It's eight 
eight colors. Each one of those colors has a different block. There's 12 of these things. You can't do this in normal press. Oh. He went to Home Depot and bought a floor roller that you use for laying down linoleum. And it didn't have enough pressure, so he extended the axle and added free weights. Oh. This is how he printed the, well, I mean, there's only five of them, but still. And he also had to replace a bunch of the, some workers thought that it was scrap lumber and they used it to make a chute off the roof. So a bunch of them had to be replaced. The point is, this is a very large commitment. It's this extraordinary riveting. Thing. And what he's riffing on is this tradition in Western painting. Sure. People having a lover, lovely, leisurely time in a beautiful garden somewhere. But he transported it to public housing. And the exact building he used as the setting for the huge untitled woodcut was the Robert Taylor Homes, which was part of this corridor, these State Street Corridor of Public Housing, which is four miles, a neighborhood in Chicago known as Bronzeville. City of Chicago, there were a lot of problems, gang warfare, etc., in Bronzeville. Carrie and his wife had bought and renovated an abandoned house about about two blocks away. Studio, also on the block two blocks away. He saw everything that was going on, and he knew the neighborhood. They had their windows shot out one Christmas, and when he spoke to the cops about it, the cops' advice was to stay away from windows. There were a lot of problems. But the city of Chicago's solution was to tear down the project. As you may know from reading the newspaper, it didn't actually solve the problem. Guns and gang Gang. warfare in Chicago. But it did produce a lot of dislocation. For Cary, it became the kickoff for a project that's still ongoing, which is his Rhythm Master, which was first installed Carnegie as part of the Carnegie International. And he did this installation where he made all of these little origami sculptures, and he put them in these vitrines that normally normally hold decorative arts, and then he lined the vitrines with newspapers so that everybody tries to look past the newspaper to look at the things, except for the newspaper is the point. Because the newspaper is all of these comics that he designed, futuristic city called the Black Metropolis, which is another name for Bronzeville, the real place and this future place. And you have these characters who um, are using robots to do vendetta right by shootings. But you also have this atavistic thing, which is the idea that one person has the skill to use drumming patterns to awaken all the African sculptures in the Art Institute of Chicago and turn them into superheroes. So you've Uh, got robots, you've got superheroes based on African sculptures. Pretty much all the action takes place recognizably on the block where his studio is. So you can recognize the buildings, you can recognize the signs. Halfway to being some complete Uh, fantasy, but also totally locatable on Google Street. A curious melding, and it has taken all of these forms. So this was the initial comics that he did for the Carnegie, these very specific sculptures, each one of which has a particular superpower, not necessarily in terms of how they were understood by the people who made them, but in terms of the second life that he's given. And then he decided to drop the sort of coherent comic book things and went over to this format he calls the Daily, because the thing he liked about daily newspaper strips is that they're pretty much impossible to follow, right? You get three panels on one day, you miss a day, you come back, there's something else going on. You've got all these different storylines on the same page. He said, for freewheeling cultural and critical commentary, I cannot think of a more flexible platform than the daily newspaper comic. The loosely gridded standard half page can accommodate an extraordinary variety of styles, subjects, and treatments. And the near impossible feat of following one's favorite strips for long interrupted sequences makes discontinuity integral to our experience of the medium. Interruption then becomes a useful device for stocking uh, complex scenarios and playing around with shifting areas of attention. So Rhythm Master has now been going for almost 25 years. We get little installments every now and then and connect and it's not like Dickens giving us a new chapter of great expectations. Bits and pieces. it's on you to try to pull together. So there's a central story, central strip called Rhythm Master about sculptors and the robots. There's one called P-Van, which consists entirely of dialogue taking place in a white 
band that used to park in front of his studio for eight hours a day, people sitting in it just talking and listening to music. He invented so, these conversations that roam from everything to President's Day sales to whether John Adams was actually a racist or not to they go all over the place. And then on the stroll is dedicated to giving the local streetwalkers a voice on things like um, Afrofuturism and postmodernism and things like this. They, they discuss a lot of philosophy. Added ads because you need ads to have a coherent world. And as these things were used in various installations, they traveled around the world in different shows. He added languages, so now a lot of the bubbles exist in four or five languages. Everybody's multilingual at the same time. And what he's doing with these these aren't etchings, these aren't wood. These are India ink drawings that take forever, that he then scans the different sections, puts together. Initially, what he was doing was going to Kinko's in the middle of the night and just printing them out on big sheets of newsprint. And the advantage was he never put them up for sale, but he could use them in exhibitions and installations, dozens and dozens and dozens of them together, and then he could change them up. He stopped liking one, he took it out, he destroyed it, he put it in a different one, changed the languages, he added new strips. He, this is in here because the way he guarantees the continuity between all of these as you're moving through these different worlds and he's got these actors doing these different things is he uses, he builds sets with Lego and containers from takeout food and desktop what? toys and dolls. And his favorite is a Jessica Alba, the Fantastic Four franchise, which has 28 points of articulation. He has stock clothing. He learned how to sew. The one studio assistant he ever had, um, he brought in so that she could teach him how to sew and got a singer sewing machine. And he makes the costumes for well, them. Anything that, that will have a small pattern. So it's like napkins and placemats and things like that, which is why when you look at Rhythm Master, we have a good one here. The clothes are like vaguely futuristic, but it's partly, they often have really large buttons on them. They're a little bit too thick for collision of scale that goes on. He tried doing screen prints. He thought there were some that he was pretty sure, you know, stay as they were for a while. So he started doing screen prints of them, making sure, separating them from the ones that were just run off at Kinko's Bite. They're on proper paper and you can see there's a nice white margin around the outside, even though it has the news on the inside. But he's doing this with his own kludged setup and he couldn't, speech bubbles was the real so problem. He did about five of these, and then he had another printer who had better equipment do four of them. And then he went out and bought himself a complete professional screen printing rig so that he could do this in his studio. By the time he got it all set up, he had discovered UV print commercial signage technology. It has inks that are cured by being exposed to ultraviolet light, and it makes them basically weatherproof, and you can print on anything. He started printing on this translucent kind of milky plexiglass so that it has kind of the affect of a screen, except it also is kind of like a drawing. They're mounted, you can see the shadow, they're mounted so that they stand just off the wall. But then he goes and he does, they're signed, they're in small editions, they're signed and numbered on the back like proper works of art. But on the front, printed his name and the date, bog standard commercial piece. And so it's, it's still in this kind of rhythm master universe of, is it a document or is it a prop within the rhythm master? He doesn't really repeat things between very much. The one exception is there's a phrase that he got really attached that he invented for Rhythm Master. Everything's going to be all right. I just know it will. And the reason was because it sounded like the hokiest comic language in the world. But it's also like something everybody wants to hear. So it, it again exists in this sort of in-between space of absolute sincerity and wh whatever, how, however you might want to dismiss it. And so that phrase has become this kind of Rhythm Master Master appears again and again in these different scenarios. So this leads to most recent format for Rhythm Master, which are 
the strips. And these are, instead of having every a few things on one page with a lot of white space, they're abutted end to end. And these things are seven inches high, can go on for, say, 60 feet. And it's like a trailer, which is, there's all these jump cuts. You're going from one scene to another scene to another scene. Don't have narrative continuity, but if you look really carefully, a Benin bronze statue flying through the air over here that is also in the air over to piece here. things together, but never entirely. It's just enough to tell you this is all part of the same universe. This is all somehow part of the same story. So Rhythm Master is taking up a lot of time, but it's never it's never been going to close with just two things. One is he loves etching, and he hadn't made one since he was in college. It wasn't convenient, a giant acid bath. And finally, 2010, he agreed to go out to Berkeley to a print workshop there. He was working on one big one that he has kind of mixed feelings about, but while he had to sit around while they were working on the big one doing fiddly things, and they noticed that he was not a happy camper. These smaller plates to just, he will tell you he's not a doodler. He just, he went out, found a secondhand shop, got some Barbies. He came back to the studio. He made a shirt for the Barbie out of a piece of tracing vellum, and that's the woman you see on the right. Uh, man on the left, he thinks that the hoodie was made from an old sock. Took the plates, started them there, done them for the next three years, uh, and eventually they went back to California and God. printed in editions. These um, are also part, part of this continuing aspiration to show all the pieces of what people's life can be. It's no longer the case that you walk into a museum and there are no images of blood. But it is often the case that those images double down on heroism or victimhood or things that are specific to the world many black people live in, in our society. And one of the things that Carrie's been after is the whole gamut, just like being pissed off, just for no reason other than it's a lousy day, or having a great day for no reason, or stupid romance. I mean, you get to have it all. That's one of the things he's used his, his prints to do. So he had he was going to do a whole series that were just going to be. He's he's got he's got two of them done. <laughs> this was one of them. But one of the things that's interesting is called Satisfied Man. It's a picture of a smiling guy. I have several times seen it described as a grimace because we're so programmed to see there must be there must be a negative in here somewhere. That's not the intention here. It's just, and by the way, it's 2015. He got his MacArthur in 1996, I think. This is, he's, he printed it himself, the edition as well as the proofs. And when the New York Times came to do a story, he as yeah. the block behind him and the print hanging on the wall when they did the photographs. So, so. <laughs>